Well, thanks everybody. It's been a great, exciting night. Um, we are still about an hour away from the final ballots being tallied. So, you know, we were we were going to wait until later in the day. Uh, Speaker Mattiello did concede earlier on. Um, this morning, we saw the press release go out. He did not reach out to us personally, but we, we take it as a concession and thank him for all of his years of service here in District 15. What's your explanation for why you scored such a decisive victory over one of the most powerful elected officials in Rhode Island? Yeah, the margin was pretty big as it stands right now. We're up about 18. Um, people rejected the way that Speaker Mattiello was running the State House, ran his campaigns, um, and we were looking towards the future. And we literally outworked him. We've been working every night since June at the doors. We're talking about health care reforms. We're talking about safer and stronger school buildings, education. And those type of messages in a post-COVID era are what people wanted to hear. They wanted to hear what we were doing in the next two years, next five years. And we were talking about our plans and not about scandals, you know, and trying to explain away the scandals of the past like he had to. Barbara, when you were knocking on those doors, uh, you just alluded to it, but what were some of the, the key issues that people were well, the corruption was one big issue, but also, too, they were not meeting, okay? That was one of the probably his biggest errors, was not bringing the General Assembly back, okay? COVID is one of the biggest crises that we've ever faced here in Rhode Island, and the fact that they were not even back in the building trying to come up with Plan A, Plan B, Plan C. We are in a major hole with the budget right now. We are seeing unprecedented numbers again in spikes. We don't have the policies in place. Small businesses are hurting, and people were just like, if you don't want to do the job anymore, it's time for you to go. So that, that was a big error on his part have a background in health care. Mm -hmm. What do you expect to bring to the table in that regard? Yeah, we're going to be talking about ways to lower the price of prescription drugs. We're going to talk about new ways to combat the opioid epidemic, which is having its one of its worst years ever. So those are going to be my two major focuses right away. In regard to the COVID crisis? Yeah, I mean, we right now... What can you contribute to? Well, let's talk about the priority number one on that right now. It's got to be how are we giving relief to our small businesses. Unfortunately, as the governor starts to talk about kind of scaling back a little bit, unfortunately, with the gatherings, I'm really worried here in Cranston about our restaurants, about some of our small businesses that might not make it through the winter. So that would be the first priority. Do you have any objections to the way she has handled the uh, insistence on wearing masks and the no. um, he other health cons um, considerations that she's put forth? No, I think we need to wear masks. And I think that there's enough evidence right now that t I always wear one when we're out knocking on the doors. I'm not, I think it's a sign of respect. I think right now until we have a vaccine and people are, start to take the vaccine, which is going to be another fight. Um, yeah, no, it, I think that's one of our only ways of getting this to a better place so that we can keep our businesses open. We have to keep our economy open at this point. Is Joe Sicarci too closely associated with Speaker Mattiello for him to be an effective speaker? Uh, I don't think so at all. I have actually, of all the people in politics here in Rhode Island, and I've been around a lot of them, I've actually never met Joe. Um, I don't think he's too close. We'll see what his plans are. My big thing on the next speaker is who's going to talk about good government reforms, like the line item veto, talk about things like term limits, what are their plans? Um, and I'll be interested to see what Joe Shikarchi brings. The women involved in that women's caucus are backing a woman mm -hmm. for the speakership. Can you see getting behind that, or do you feel they're too... Are they too progressive for your liking or too liberal? So I would never back someone just because they're a woman, okay? But we'll give everybody an equal chance and we'll talk about their plans for the future. I think Joe Shikarchi's talked about more pro-business plans in the past, um, and he has a record, but, you know, we can compare that and we'll hear from all the candidates. There might be other people jumping in. Once Yellow I was involved with a number of controversies that you just mentioned before, and you haven't shied away from that in no. your campaign. Um, two questions for you. My first is what made you have that be a part of your campaign? Yeah, I mean, it's not just, you know, you can mess up once in life and people will usually give you a redo. If you just own your mistake and you try to fix it, people will say, hey, look, you know, here's a mulligan, okay? You have one, two, three, four, five controversies in a row. And the other thing is Speaker Mattiello never owned it. He never said, you know what, you know, we're talking about the Jeff Britt scandal in the trial. He never stopped and said, you know what, it was my campaign. There might have been a whole lot of mess ups underneath me, but I own it. And he never fixed it. Like, he never did that. And I think people would have respected if he got there. He never did. And for four years, we heard excuses. And just Should the have. second part of yep. that also, um, do you think, how do you think that played in your favor in the polls? You think that was a big reason that people are standing here right now? Um, I think it's, it is a definitely a contributing factor. Um, and the fact the way he ran the state house is a lot how he ran his campaigns. Um, we talked about the spying on Frias's young family. We're talking about using the taxpayer-funded positions for his campaign. It all played a factor. Should have been our first question Sorry. to you. Do you plan to caucus with the Republicans? Yes, they're meeting tonight.
Do you support maintaining the car tax base out of Champion by the Speaker? Uh, of course, and the Governor and the Senate President have also committed to that. Your, your victory was one of the bright spots for the Republican Party last night. Is there any broader significance? Uh, yeah, what do you think of how the party did elsewhere in the state? Is there any broader message from your victory? Uh, I think it doesn't matter what party you're in. If you work your butt off and you go door to door and you spell your message, you can really make good gains. And I think the Republican Party has to do that on a broader perspective. I mean, here in Cranston, on my husband's legacy and whatnot, this is a Republican town. It looks like we'll keep a Republican mayor here. We did pretty well on the council seats, despite the fact that everybody kept saying there's a blue wave coming, there's a blue wave coming. And I think we're holding our own. And I think it's a big tribute really to my husband, but also the way we've run business here in Cranston. You've not heard from the Matty Yellow camp directly, have you? Not at all. Are you expecting to? Um, I think it's been almost six hours since he put out a statement and we've heard nothing. So I, you know, I hope to at some point, but I'm, you know, we're moving on. Do you see that as a blight? Uh, I, I consider it the way he's kind of run his campaign and run the state house. It, it doesn't bother me at this point. And like I said, we're moving on. Speaking of your husband, does your campaign signal to you that your husband should take another run for governor? I think my husband would be a rock star in several positions um, and it will be up to him and how, up to our family on where we look at in 2022. I think the sky's the limit, and I think this morning we heard a lot of people asking him to reconsider and think about 2022 again. Waking up this morning, um, what was going through, I mean, what was going through your head? Talking about emotion, Matty Yellow has held this seat for quite some time, so yeah. how does that feel that you're the first to be able to sort of, what, what's going through your head? Take him down. Well, I really built on the success of what Steve Frias has done in the 16 and 18 election, and we talked about it last night too. I wouldn't be here today without the, the hard work that Steve Fry has put into it. He's been an integral part of our team. Um, and, you know, it just sometimes it just takes a few knocks, you know, to take down the speaker. This wasn't so much going against one person. It was going against an establishment that, you know, really was creating culture up there of fear. And that was creating a lot of other issues and trying to get good bills passed. Um, and I, I think it's really a testament to if you just keep trying, don't be afraid of taking on the big guy. Okay, it, it pays dividends and it, hopefully it'll pay dividends for the state. Yes, over here. You had some prominent progressive voices supporting you during the campaign. Do you see that as a, a one off or do you see opportunities to work with? with uh, well, it, this was a diverse coalition. I had socially conservative Republicans, I had moderate Democrats, there were some progressives that, you know, were, were talking and supported me on Twitter. Um, put it this way I always said to everybody here, I was like, unless you're in District 15, I, I want you guys to stay out. And, the support that I got was really organic to District 15. Um, I ran this in a bipartisan manner. When we're talking about health care and education reforms, this is not a, a partisan issue, or it shouldn't be. And so we were able to get a lot of support from people across party lines. That's what I'm going to bring to the State House. We'll work with whoever in order to get this done.